thank you very much, Chairman, for those opening remarks. And first, may I, I say many, many thanks to you all for inviting us to come up from the Wirral to the newly formed Wire Amateur Radio Society and how delighted I am to see how its membership has increased enormously since I was first talking to Dave some time ago. The talk you're going to hear this evening was first given to the Wirral Amateur Radio Society way back almost 40 years ago, before some of you in this room were even born these events that I am about to depict will, uh, actually took place. It's been specially requested tonight um, by Dave, G0FYD, who's at home watching cricket on TV. <laughs> I did a spy catcher to the Whittle Amateur Radio Society way back in, I think it was about 1947, 48, when I blew the whistle on the work that I'd been doing with naval intelligence during World War II. It was then a little local thing, and I thought it wouldn't matter very much because there was only a few. And the kind of work that we were, we were doing, or had been doing, uh, was beginning to leak out in the press anyway. So um, I took it upon myself to, to try this. I volunteered as a young man on committee when the committee were desperate. And if you've worked on a committee in an amateur radio society, you'll know the problem of forming programs, as we do on the Whittle, and I'm sure you do up here. And in a weak moment, I volunteered, a thing that I'd been taught never to do when I was in the forces. And I volunteered to give this talk on uh, Japanese morph, and they all thought I was pulling their legs. And they asked me what it was about, and I said, I can't possibly tell you. It takes so long, I'll have to show you. And from then, the talk has developed, and I picked up information down the years, added to it, and eventually brought it reasonably up to date with an overhead projector. And this is the talk that I'm going to give you tonight. The talk, I suppose, finds its attraction in the fact that it's a peculiar situation. If you've learned Morse yourself, or if you're struggling with Morse, just consider how we're going to send a language like Japanese, which, are pict which is a pictographic language. That is to say, in Japanese, they don't have letters of the alphabet as we do, similarly in Chinese and other Eastern languages. They have rather pictograms, pictures of words and phrases. And I understand that for a basic conversation in Japanese, you need about 10,000 symbols. So could you imagine trying to have 10,000 more symbols? Could you imagine what the last symbol would sound like? how many combinations of dots and dashes there would be. And you just got it sent, and he comes back with a diddy da da did it. <laughs> so clearly, some other system had to be found. And later, I will show exactly how this took place. Incidentally, the title of the talk, Japanese Morse, or how they did it sideways, uh, may I tell you that all the beds in our house go that way down the bedroom, none of them go sideways. <laughs> There's no Japanese blood, I assure you, in my veins. I should imagine that the average European who, whose language is based upon an alphabetic script derived mainly from the Greeks uh, would be quite puzzled to see how pictograms work. And in order to illustrate this, I have drawn up uh, a, project, a, a projection to show you the system. Those of you who know your American history will know that the US 7 Cavalry was wiped out by the combined might of several Red Indian tribes at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And the US 7 Cavalry was led by one, uh, led by one Colonel Custer. And when the battle was over, they found a note in Custer's pocket. It was the last message he sent just before the Indians raided. And it was in code, and it was in pictograms. And if we look at the pictograms, they're utterly meaningless to us. But it's OK if you know the code. It simply says, holy mackerel, look at all those <laughs> Indians. <laughs> And incidentally, as a side, that's my interpretation of Colonel Custer's last stand. 
We are, tend to be put off in the West by uh, pictograms, uh, and the problem still arises, how did the Japanese solve this problem of turning a pictographic language into Morse? Well, first of all, let's have a look at some Chinese pictograms. These are quite genuine, except that they're very, very old. Very old. Now, sorry, we, we'll actually redo that. That comes later. Excuse me. You'll notice that none of this is scripted. I've never scripted it in my life, and I don't intend to start now. Let me show you how this works out. In old Chinese, that stands for room, because it's an ideogram, it's a pictogram. You actually have to depict a room in simple terms. It's four walls. A picture of a man in old Chinese is a trunk, two legs, and two arms, and that's a man. Now the, oh, if you know anything about the East, you know that the women are always held to be inferior, so they are shown as half a man. Let me hasten to add, I'm not from the Far East before I get run off the premises. <laughs> but this is the clever bit. What they then do is combine those ideograms and make an entirely new meaning of the word. Take a room and put in it a man and a woman sharing the room, and in old Chinese, that stands for contentment. Take the room and put two women in it, and you know what that means. <laughs> now that is genuine old Chinese. It's not modern, I hasten to assure you. I'll show you in a minute. This is nothing to do with it. This is to do with Norman Kendrick and his peculiar mind. Two men sharing a room means, hello, sailor. <laughs> For my troubles over the last 35, 40 years, I've taught children. And we had some cracking Chinese kids in the school that I taught. And there's one girl in the sixth form who I spoke to and asked her, could she still write Chinese? And she said she could. And I asked her to write those words for me, and this is what she wrote. It doesn't bear any resemblance to what I've shown you, except for trouble, where you get these characters sharing, but it looks like one over root trouble, doesn't it? So this is some idea of how ideograms work. Now, the Europeans, as you know from your history, first made contact with the Japanese, which was a very close society in the Middle Ages. Some time ago on TV, there was an excellent series which showed you the opening up of Japan to the West, and it told you a great deal about the Japanese language. And if you remember the particular thing, I think it was called Shogun, you actually saw this fellow was given six months to learn the language, uh, otherwise he would be decapitated. I looked at the girl that was teaching him, and I thought, I thought, well, if I'd have been in these shoes, I'd have said, well, bugger the language, girl, we'll have a bit of fun, and that'll be worth it at the end of six months. <laughs> but she told him a little about the language, and I listened very carefully to it because of my interest. And she told me something that I already knew, that Japanese is a very long-winded language. It takes lots and lots of symbols to say a little, because the language is very simple. For instance, if you take English, as a, or even a continental language, let's take a, a simple English phrase, I have, if you want to put that into the interrogative, you just turn it round and say, have I. As in French, you say, vous avez, avez-vous, you turn it round. Not the Japanese. They have to put a long-winded phrase on the end of a statement to turn it into the interrogative. And she demonstrated this, and you kept hearing him asking questions this way. Now, the reason I've given you the background to this, that I'm jumping ahead a bit now, when the Japanese captured Singapore, they renamed it Shonan. They renamed it Shonan. And we used to, not supposed to, but we used to listen to the propaganda broadcast from Shonan. And they were given by a man, not a woman, as Tokyo Rose did on the other networks. And I can't speak any Japanese, but to illustrate how um, flowery the language is, how long would it is. There was a joke going around the station on which I work, and one guy gets up on the stage one night and he takes off this Japanese um, uh, news announcer 
And he said, here, Radio Shonan, formerly Singapore. Here, news in Japanese. And he goes on like this about 10 minutes. And then he stops and he says, here, same news in English. No news. <laughs> and this is a little illustration of how flowery the language can be. Not quite as bad as that, I assure you. Now, what the Japanese did this, when they opened up relations with the West, first of all, they borrowed the language from China in the first place. And then they found they had to Europeanize their language in order to make contact with the West for trade and so on. And they introduced a system called Kirikana, K-A-N-A, Kirikana. Later, it got more technical, though they needed more technical phrases, and they changed it to Kata Kana. And if you look on the keyboards of some, um, of some computers and so on, you can actually see the Kana symbols printed on them. This is a European form of Japanese, and the best way to illustrate how it works is to show you by the overhead projector. First of all, those symbols are in Kana.